Um, so we saw something pretty amazing today. It yeah, is incredible, an incredible documentary when it comes to seeing what the Naughty Dog team had to do uh, to get Last of Us to, right? To us, mm-hmm. right? I, I celebrate because I know that that is a world that you love. Uh, I'm still going through the show. I've watched a lot of it. I have not played it, maybe a little bit, but outside of that, I feel I feel so good about what I saw in the documentary. And I will I, I'm gonna cherish a lot of things that I experienced in that documentary, but I want you to definitely lead with uh this conversation because that is a world that you experienced, you know, before I did. Um and the only thing we have in common right now is the fact that we both watched a documentary and I could see why people appreciate it. So um, definitely talk to us about Last of Us, the documentary and what you saw. So for anybody who hasn't watched it after you listen to our episode and what we have to say, or even if you want to watch it first and come back to it, it is available on YouTube. It's two hours long and it is two hours that is totally worth it. Um, I did watch it while I was cooking today. And there's a few times where I just had to stop and appreciate and listen to what they were having to say. Um, I probably will go back to to watch it again, honestly. Um, it, it was definitely interesting to just live through that journey with them. And then for me personally to see like what we're, we were doing, what we were recording or what we were experiencing as like, you know, they're going through and creating this game, um, from even when they were talking about, you know, E3 and PSX and how I felt during those reveals, like and, and the thing is, a lot of the time as a fan or as a gamer, you don't really think about how much work and time and effort was put into it that led to those moments that we cherish for experiencing and seeing for the first time. Um, and then I also like as, as a side part of it, like not having E3 come back again and how they were talking about E3, because at that time it wasn't canceled. This was this was pre pandemic where we were always looking forward to it during this time, January, February is when we would be applying for our media badges um, to have the excitement and how they were talking about it. Like all the big announcements are, are, are saved just for E3 and how they even spoke like that, that feeling of when they created either a demo or a trailer and just to see the crowd's reaction and that high and, and that, that joy that came to them after all of this work is just like, do they still get that? I mean, yeah, we have, we just had the state of play. We had the Xbox showcase, but even though those are exciting things and you have Nintendo direct, um, but Nintendo's never really been a part of E3. They do their own thing. So I don't know if it, it, it applies directly to them, but for all the other studios, um, I don't know if they, if you get that same thrill and excitement without E3, yes, it's still exciting. And yes, we still love it. And yes, it's still a lot of work, but there's just something about how they were talking about E3 where suddenly I realized, and it just kind of really hit me what it really means to not have E3 anymore. Um, there are a lot of great things that are, you know, for announcements and um, Jeff Keighley does. But is it really the same? And I I think just watching that documentary for how much work um, goes into these games that we take for granted um, because we're we don't see that we 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 don't understand it we can't fully fathom we like we know that they put a lot of work into it but we we can't fathom how much passion how much love how much time they put into it and I think that this documentary really showcases that so well. Um, and you know, even like it, I believe it opens up with them just talking about the storyline of what part two is going to be and not like they have a general idea. They have a general story that they want to go to about how much of it changed from having this like four hour meeting talking and discussing. So we are doing part two. This is a story we've got so far. These are the sketches of the storyboard. Let's go make this happen to this end product that we have now. Um, it just it was a beautiful process to watch them too, but then also heartbreaking because of the things that happened during this production time. And to see, like I think I genuinely love to see not okay, I can't say I loved it, 
but I am appreciative of them being so raw about their feelings about the lowest part, even trying to create this during the pandemic to through the leaks, through the harassment, through all of this stuff. And it's like we talk about leaks and we talk about, you know, how, you know, it's it's just shameful. It's like it's hurtful to these to the studio. But again, that's something else that we can't fully fathom. And the fact that they showed that, like I, I love not just naughty dogs but just each individual person for their part in this and my appreciation for not just naughty dogs but for all studios for all games that like we come to enjoy so uh that for that and my initial impressions that's where i'm at i know we're going to dive deeper into like certain aspects of this that we can deep dive into those feelings but um yeah that that first hour i i, I believe it was the first hour to hour 15 maybe it was describing the process then that was pre-pandemic um to the changes that they had and i i i'm just amazed i'm amazed by all of it even even with the delay that they had which again we we say here like if you need to take that time you need to delay a game to perfect it take it and they really showcased um in this documentary that those delays are are necessary you know they had their first like okay this is what the release date is and then they were six months out like is that really realistic and having to go back to the drawing board and see like hmm, maybe not we need to delay it because the game isn't where it should be at this time point we need to polish it so i i liked i like seeing the whole process from how they made the levels to um the mocap to the voice acting, to the music, to, you know, getting ready for E3 or PSX. Um, it was wonderful. I feel like there's there's more games that I want to see that create a documentary like this. Like I would totally love to see one um from Ninja Theory uh for Hellblade. I would I would love that. Yeah, absolutely. So what are, you, what are your initial impressions? And so much, you know, and one of the things that we talked about, because um I was really inspired by everything that I saw there. And I was thinking even about our own journey uh, when it comes to, you know, documenting and stuff, uh, but we'll get to that later. Uh, when I was watching uh, this particular documentary, I was thinking about, you know, the shifts that they made for a company culture, you know, that really hit me and team morale. Of course, the other stuff about creating and, um, you know, the individuals who got brought on when they needed help to craft the story a little bit more, you know, the lead writer and stuff like that. And she expressed, you know, her, her uh, frustrations about how people, you know, viewed certain characters and, you know, if women needed to play a part in this, that, and the other, and were women behind creating this process or story and stuff like that. And one of the things that I remember her saying, she was like, Hey, you know, just do a little bit of research and you realize it's a woman. That's the lead writer of the things that you're experiencing. Right. And I love that part. Right. And, and you mentioned that it was two hours, uh, two hours of a lot of things that was covered. And I wouldn't be surprised if the documentary itself gets awards because I think it was, you know, amazingly done. Right. Uh, so team morale focused on, which, which had me thinking about, you know, us for sure. Whenever I watch things like that and it talks about teams and it talks about restructuring, you know, talks about what crunch means to the team. How do we define that? You know, do we, do they stay late? Do they go home? Do they work from home? Do they do hybrid stuff? Right. And I, and I was thinking about, you know, what part of that can we change, you know, for us, you know, as a team when we're recording podcasts and what does that mean? Are we only talking when the podcast is on or is there other ways that we could document uh, that journey and conversation that people can get a glimpse of those things? maybe somewhat regularly, maybe before we record the podcast or something like that, maybe we could do something. Um, and I started thinking about what does that mean? You know, and I just have this thing this year and even moving forward to document those things, because I think that they could learn from, from that. Cause we're pretty polished when we're on. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and when it comes to recording a podcast, we, we know, you know, how to bounce the ideas off each other. We know how to hand it off and things like that when it comes to the conversation and the subject matter. But when we're not on, can we be on and not on? What does that look like? And I think one of the things I wanted to consider this year, which we kind of did earlier today, was do IG lives documenting us getting ready for, you know, what the podcast episode looks like and even some, you know, frustrations that we have, you know, IRL, you know, of course, it's going to be framed. You know, for privacy purposes, of course, you know, depending on what we decide to share, 
But I think that those things are important because individuals who are content creators, they're not just creating audio only, they're creating video. And if there's things that we can share from our journey that could help them, maybe that's something that we should focus on this year. So um, I think the the first round for that, because we did that on IG, you're Miss DJM on there. I'm Uriah, U-R-I-Y-Y-A. And we went for at least 20 minutes. You know, I talked about the the stuff that was going on with us last year into this year and leading into even a preview of some of the topics that we're going to talk about today. And Last of Us is definitely one of, one of the big ones. Um, outside of Team Morale, watching that particular documentary, uh, the other thing that I was focusing on, too, is the timing. Why are they sharing this now? Because if the if the outbreak day is September and and the E3 vibe a Summer Games Fest is in June, then why is this coming out now? So, so that's my question. Are, are there going to be, I know they tease some stuff, you know, at the end, but why now? Because one of the things that they, uh, Neil, I believe talked about in the documentary is even the presentation and what we show in the trailers and even the demo is marketing something. And you can connect the dots between the other things that we've shared over the years leading to that particular announcement for Last of Us Part Two. Even that is marketing. So this documentary is marketing too, because it's showing us a, a different picture of not only Naughty Dog as a studio, as you mentioned, but the fact that all studios at the heart of the pandemic went through something, right? Yeah. And we don't necessarily see, you know, all that. And as you mentioned, you know, Ninja Theory would be good. I think Destiny would be good. You know, uh, Bungie as a team, um, 343 Industries, you know, what they've done with Halo from what it was to bringing it back to things that we appreciate, old maps and things of that nature. And we can go on and on about all the documentaries they want to see. Uh, Dev Diaries are great, but I think those Dev Diaries put together into like, you know, an amazing documentary would be good for a lot of uh, these studios that we enjoy. Microsoft leading into uh, buying uh, the, the big 60 whatever million it was, you know, for that, you know, acquisition. What does that look like as a documentary? Will we even see that, you know, from them? That'd be interesting, but you know, I'll yield there. Any and let's let's open it up a little bit, um, because this was a, a big a big documentary and a great watch. Um, well, where do you want to start? Because there there's I think the part that hit me the most. I'll, I'll, I don't know why this is what's coming to my mind is is because it's at the top of my brain that bothered me the most, and it's not it's not the direct, uh, the documentary. It was just like what they were going through was um. You know, you're, they're hit with this pandemic. They're having to figure out how to work from home, how to not have to go to a point where they have to cease production or just like, OK. Um, and they're trying to make it happen as quickly as possible where they had, you know, somebody hack into the back door of their server. Um, and then when they patch it up, have everything just like leaked. And I remember um you know during that uh, period i'm sure we we probably talked on it a bit um when it was happening about these leaks that were coming out and you know how fans were upset about certain things and how all of this was kind of this ruined and you know i know we talk about and say like hey that just does a disservice to the devs who work so hard on this but to see to see their anger to see their frustration, to see all of this work that they put in ruined and to have what I, I don't know if they are fans, they say they're fans, but then to have them verbally attack them online, send out these death threats to, to any, any of that, that length for why, because you didn't like some like in-game, not even polished footage storyline that you don't know how this plays out and you're just, you're just mad about it. And, and then they're just taking this, this raw end. It's not like you, you can directly come out and defend yourself because you can't say much more on the game that you're working on without spoiling anything. And they can only defend themselves so much that part. Like I felt that anger for them. Um, and again, it's something that we just cannot fully fathom, but to, to go after and, like threatening someone's child like how low of a person do you have to be to do that um and just to see like listen to them just like talk about it through through tears um that is that's traumatizing and that wants to like that kind of like 
wants to push you out of like, is this a feel for me? If this is what I have to to deal with. And it's not just Naughty Dogs. There's a lot of studios that get, you know, death threats because a supposed fan doesn't like how long a game is taking or doesn't like the story that is being told or any number of ridiculous reasons. So Naughty Dog isn't the only one. We, we've seen this before for numerous reasons, but we don't ever get to see how it affects the writers, how it affects the actors, how it affects the developers, anybody that works in that studio. We don't get to see that. So it's just like that loss of concept and making that connection, really. We understand that it sucks. We understand like if it happened to me, that would, that would I wouldn't be happy. Um, so that part of the documentary really, really, really hit me. Like it was just that the empathy and sympathy I have for them. And then just amazing that they pushed through it and still created this amazing game that even after all of that, even after those leaks, um, people loved, if not like just as much, if not more than part one. Yeah. Yeah. That was definitely uh, interesting to see. The, the other thing too, is when you think about the leak, right? So since you brought that up, let's talk about that for a few. They decided to make sure that everything, any assets were only at one location right and when it comes to that there wasn't anything outside of that no redundancy according to what they mentioned in the documentary right we don't know maybe they did have that maybe not right but according to what we saw everything was in one place at that location right and for the the fan uh to go in uh, through the back door of that particular, you know, data center, whatever, you know, and do that to try to push their hand to release, you know, the title. I, I don't think any to that magnitude, I don't think any particular studio has said, oh, because this is out, we're going to release a whole game. Maybe they might release a trailer a little bit earlier, right? Or now that you've seen part of this trailer, okay, so now we're going to just release it in 24 hours or at a particular day within days away, but never a full game. Not that I recall, you know, seeing that. So even the thought of pushing the hand of a studio to release a whole game because you decide to hack into their servers, I thought that was just kind of silly, you know, uh, to think about that. And, and to go through the process of, as you mentioned, being angry and then thinking about it, what are we doing this for? Who are we doing this for? Right. And after a while, you know, deciding to let, let it go. And just, you know, appreciate the process and, and the creative uh, process of everything that they put together and say, hey, you know, it is what it is. We just have to move forward and to see what it has become, not only as a game that everybody appreciates, but even the show itself that everybody appreciates. Um, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. And my thing is, you know, with this particular topic, uh, I definitely want to touch on what you would consider the next chapter will be. Um, any thoughts? Uh, before we get to that, you know, I definitely want to hear uh, from you because this this was a pretty dope documentary and it it's encouraging me to even be more active in in what we do and, and how we share information. Yes, we share information here on a podcast. You know, people will see that um, on online, on YouTube, you know, on IG now because we're doing some, you know, small little diaries there. I think that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out throughout the year. But uh, before we get to the part that they talked about, the teaser at the end. Um, any other parts in the documentary that you want to you know, touch on? Um, no, I just, I, I love the entire process of it. I, th I think that first hour is definitely a bit more lighthearted. Um, you know, in the second half of it, um, definitely hit some like, you know, in the heart there, especially with the, you know, um, the scene with Joel, um, that scene. I guess is being titled um, of of watching how they recorded that. And, you know, you got to say, I, I, it's not that it's common to say that, well, at least not within my circle to my understanding. But if anybody wants to say that a voice actor is not an actor, like your traditional Hollywood actor, I don't know what you're talking about because the way that they recorded um, the mocap and everything like that, the facial movements and entire scene was emotional. And they're just like in these bodysuits with black dots on their face that even that was still emotional to watch. And that's not without that. That was just me not even thinking back to actually seeing it in game. 
But to see how they all did it and they gave it they all and it was just raw emotion that they even the you know it you know they they actually generally cried and just to say goodbye to not just a character but you know a fellow voice actor Troy Baker um they are so actors they get really into it and they just have a different medium to do it than your traditional actors but they still make you feel something they still present this entire experience for you and, and yeah it's a little it's more than just them it's the entire art team and sound directors but they are the ones who bring that raw emotion that is then fine-tuned into this game and story that we get to play so um yeah i i really liked it from beginning to end there now um as far as you know one more chapter is i did start off with saying you know part one could have ended the way that it did and never have a sequel and it would have been fine and the same thing with part two it can end just the way it is and it'll be fine. So I, I know they tease a little bit about, you know, having a, a story just for Tommy. Um, but that's like kind of being a little bit shelved. They have some other higher projects. I don't know what I could, I, I, what more I could expect in the continuation of the story. Um, I felt that way about part one. Um, I feel that way about part two. But I know that whatever story that they're going to tell to continue this on, if there is, you know, this part three, it's going to be a ride. And I know they're going to give it as their all just as they did for one and two. Yeah. No, I love that. Uh, going back to the voice acting, uh, when I think of Kingpin in the Marvel series and the more I listen to uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, I believe that's the name and the last name. So don't don't stone me here. Kingpin, right? amazing actor so if you were to close your eyes and listen to some of your favorites whether it's laura bailey or troy baker or any other actor um denzel washington you know there there are different levels in in their voice as they're performing these scenes and if you appreciate that then you could appreciate what uh, individuals do for voice acting for any game that we play whether it's um master chief's voice or any other voice right and i think uh it's pretty powerful to actually experience those things and for for a last chapter and i haven't experienced the first two right i think that you know vicariously through you and other individuals who love this particular series um last of us i i really just appreciate everything that they've done and i have a i have even more of a deeper appreciation for the work that goes into the audio stuff the sketch artists, I, I mean, you can go down the list of everything that they showed uh, in a documentary. There are so many different pieces that make this thing great, which is why when you think of Ninja Theory and what they did with the 20 person team for the first Hellblade, it's like, how is that even possible? Right. You have to have one person do at least three or four things. And when you think of a studio like like Naughty Dog and what they've done with Lost Legacy and what they've done with all the Uncharted's and what they've done with this, right? It's incredible, you know, what they've done as a studio and as a team. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm just grateful to uh, even take a moment to appreciate that because usually if I'm on his game documentaries, I don't usually watch. And I think that's probably unfair for someone who talks about games on a podcast. Doesn't make sense, right? Uh, so going to be a little bit more sensitive about that. As far as uh, the next chapter, my thing, what I would like to see is a multiplayer type of thing because they said it's separate because because from what I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, they said it's a separate thing, but it weaves into the experiences that we already have for these two games that are out. So if that's the case, if you weave in, you know, a multiplayer experience in some way, shape or form, because the multiplayer for Uncharted, I believe, was one of the best ones out there for any multiplayer. You know, it gave you that uh, Indiana Jones type of feel. You were grabbing different treasures during the multiplayer experience for Uncharted 2. It was a great multiplayer and it disappeared. It never made it to PC. Hopefully in the future, we'll see that. So that's that's on my wish list. So if you create an experience that's free to play and will pay something and you weave it in with the last of us or even the uncharted stuff 
And maybe there's a crossover with cosmetics and things of that nature. I think that would be a great experience for everyone because that multiplayer, in my opinion, is missed. Maybe I'm the only one that's talking about it, but uh, that's my wish list. Um, and we can start um, giving some final thoughts uh, here for this documentary. Uh, Daniela? I don't know how I feel about if they added multiplayer experience. Well, we've seen it, though. I guess I'd be open. I guess I'd be open to it. I just don't know how I would directly feel about it. But actually, that would be interesting to see, especially something that's coming in and out of it. And if it follows Tommy's story, who we know Tommy went off, he did his own thing to find out what he was doing as Joel was trying to find him and all of all of this other stuff that happens between and working within this community and team and that he was away with. <laughs> so that would be an interesting point of view to have. I'm open to it. I'm not completely closed off. I'm open. Yeah. No, it's definitely good. It's definitely good. So I enjoyed the documentary. I definitely need to make a list of the documentaries that are currently out. And, you know, maybe we can have more conversations like this. Um, anything else on this before we move on? I, I think that was a lot. So definitely, if you haven't watched it yet, um, go and check it out. It's on YouTube. It's it's amazing. And I think it gives you a little bit more appreciation for the work that goes on behind this for all studios, really. And then the length that, uh, you know, they will go to to make sure things are realistic, which is something that's amazing about games right now. They are becoming more realistic on the mechanics and physics behind it all the way that it looks. I mean, I don't know if I would personally be biting into a bloody rag to see what it would look like. Um, if my throat was being ripped out, but they do. And, you know, no, <laughs> this is this is where we're at. And that's the amount of dedication that they put into this. So, yeah, definitely, definitely go and watch it. Yeah. Or or the weird sounds in the sound booth with that guy. That was pretty crazy. It is like. <laughs> Uh, that was pretty crazy but go see it you know definitely you know check out the documentary well done i'm sure it's gonna win awards for sure 